What's up, man? It's so good to be out here and to build a knife and hang out with you and your family. This has been awesome. Yeah, thanks for coming out, man. It's been been a blast. Yeah, I think we've been trying to schedule it, and I I was I, I got busy and you got busy, and I'm like, God, we got to make this work. I got to get out yeah. there because we've known each other now. Actually, I think we first met at Winter Strong. It was probably the first year you really started with Montana Knife Company. <clears throat> yeah, I think I think that was the year I actually took a few prototypes out and just kind of told everybody like. Hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing, but yeah, yeah, we, it would have been, we, we've been trying to get this together, but I think we wanted to do it in person versus over the phone. It's you know? al- it's always better. And then what else is cool is to come out here and just experience to, to a small degree, like what you do. Right. Cause you can't really see that and get that over a zoom. I mean, you know what people do, but to be immersed in it, it's completely different. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's cool. Uh, your first time in Montana, huh? Very first time. Yeah. yeah, I've always wanted to come up, but and this is what I thought. I mean, we got to drive around the other day, and yeah, I can't ima- uh, just believe the amount of deer and everything that are around here. <laughs> yeah, it was unreal. It's like, I, in fact, I told my wife the other day. I called yeah. her the other night, and uh, she's like, "So, are we buying property in Montana?" I'm like, "Yeah, we might be. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're just gonna start spanning the entire the entire country." The deer definitely did kind of put on a show for Ryan. They were. Uh, yeah. It's just that springtime in those green fields that start popping grass first and man, they just flood to them. Right. It's pretty cool. No. So have you, you said that you, your family moved here like what? what? Yeah. When I was like four or five months old. Right. My mom was born in Montana and my, all my relatives and her family, my dad was from Southeast Colorado ranching family. Um, down around like the Los Animas area. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, we moved here when I was just a baby. My parents actually tried moving up to Canada for about like two weeks after I was born. They moved up to Canada for like three months back <laughs> in like 81. And uh, the exchange exchange rates and the economy and inflation, everything was just crushing. And, you know, they were completely broke with a new baby and just trying to like start a business and start right. a life. And didn't work so they they knew they wanted to be back in montana so they pitched a penny on the map of montana and it landed on ovando montana so that's where they drove they drove there and uh they pulled in there about 11 o'clock at night and there was no uh no places to plug their camper in and they they drove up to lincoln which is 20 or 30 miles away and that i think that next night their camper froze up <laughs> and a day or two later they them and my un- aunt and uncle bought houses <laughs> that's so wild just started their life in a place they didn't know a soul so it's pretty cool what so what did they do as far as work like how did they you know back then anything that my dad could do you know he had a kind of a <clears throat> cruddy backo um you know, like cruddy, I mean, just an old backo, old open cab backo, and he was trying to start an excavation business. Okay. But he also... That's how you got into excavation. Yep. Got it. He, uh, but he was like the town mechanic. He had a diesel mechanics kind of degree and or certificate and did mechanicking and did a chimney sweeping business and volunteer firefighter and just kind of was doing all kinds of stuff. And uh, But the, the excavation business over 40 years just grew and grew yeah. into a great business for him. And yeah, that's sure. what I grew up doing. Especially with the growth that not only probably Montana experienced at that time, but even now, I mean, the growth has yeah. got to be people fleeing from, you know, California, New York, wherever. And I imagine this, the growth in this area is just unbelievable. It's crazy. It's the, it, especially, well, I moved, I moved right here to Frenchtown <clears throat> from Lincoln back in 2002 and uh, I was showing you as we were driving around, like there, there was just hay fields around where my first house was. And yeah. now it's just houses. But honestly, I think we're still just on the, the tip of the iceberg. I think oh, yeah. people are coming. The last two years, it's just exploded. Yeah, you're going to see even more of an explosion, I'm sure, over the next couple of years. COVID, you know, and I, so many of these people that now that can work from home and a lot of these companies have said, hey, you're not, you're not coming back to work. Like we're just working, working from home, things working which has freed up a lot of people to leave. And we're, you know, pretty accessible with plane travel. I mean, not necessarily from where you came from, but <laughs> yeah, when we're both remote, that makes it just a yeah. little bit harder. <laughs> but we we can, you know, connect to so many major hubs right out of here. We're usually one connection away from almost anywhere. Yeah. So So your dad was doing excavation work and then how did you get into blacksmithing? Is that something that you just thought 
this would be cool. Or you saw somebody do something one time. You're like, Oh, I should try that. Yeah. I was 11 years old and, uh, my little league baseball coach, Rick Dunkerley, he was bringing his, he was making knives. And again, okay. he was kind of in the beginning of his knife making journey. Yeah. And, uh, he was bringing those knives to practice, showing them to parents. And of oh, course really? I'm an 11 year old boy. Yeah. And so I'm like, infatuated with yeah. Them. Yeah. I mean, imagine your boy Brecken, you know, it's like, if somebody, if his coach two years ago was, you know, or what is he, 13, 14, yeah, if his, 14. if his coach two or three years ago was bringing knives to practice, he'd be all over that. Yeah. And that's I don't what, know, is that even allowed anymore? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, he, I was super interested in, so my parents that Christmas bought me one of his knives for Christmas. And then he invited me up to his shop and, uh, you know, taught me to make a knife or two. That's cool. But then he pretty quickly was like, Hey, if you're going to do this, you have to do it. Mostly it was like, Hey kid, beat it. <laughs> right. He's like, all right, you, you got to do fun. this on your own. You want to be a knife maker? You got to do it at your house. <laughs> and, uh, so he still continued to help me, but I started, I had a lawn mowing business at that age and I, and then I worked for my parents as well. And so any money I made, I put into my knife shop. Is that right? So I bought a belt grinder right off the bat back then. You know, I, I look back, that belt grinder was probably 250 or 400 bucks, probably 400 probably bucks. probably so much money for you. Oh, yeah. Back yeah. then, I thought, yeah. Did you have the money from your lawn mowing business or did, oh, yeah. or did your parents yeah. lend it to you or what? No. Well, you know, that <clears throat> over the, all, all the way through high school, you know, my needs for equipment just got greater. Of course. And so uh, at times when I didn't have the money, they would lend it to me. And okay. I always had like a, like a tally sheet of like what I owed them. Oh, yeah. And I would work it off. You know, I had an hourly wage and I'd record my hours and either work that off or um, I had a pretty successful little lawn mowing business. And so I usually had some money. And then I started selling knives. So yeah, you that's know. true. Who did you sell? Like initially, who would you sell those knives to? Was it like my, buddies and my friends? First knife sales. I think I sold my second and third knives to my. One was my science teacher and one was my math teacher. Really? Yeah, I brought my knives to a science fair and did a science fair project on heat treating oh, steel. Oh, that's cool. And yeah. they bought two of my knives for <laughs> twenty bucks a piece. That was your first show, yeah. the science fair, <clears> the, <throat> the school science fair. Yep. I was twelve and. Uh, yeah, the, and they paid me 20 bucks a piece for them. And so you were just like, this is awesome. And about 20 years later, they gave them back to me. I was going to ask if you knew them. So you have them. Yeah. They, what, what do you think now looking at them? Oh, yeah. It's it I definitely, mean, of course it's... Yeah. I mean, it's cool because you look at them and you're like, yeah, a kid built these, but they definitely you know, <laughs> came a long ways. <laughs> they, probably, they probably are better than something I've even created, even with you being... <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean. I see like yeah, because oh. we were working on on the grinder and everything, and I'd you know do a pass, and it was all like all the edges were all kind of screwed up, yeah. and then you go one pass and clean it up. I'm like, oh yeah, that that's what it's supposed to look. No, like. mine were definitely uh, <laughs> mine were definitely not as nice as yours. I did well. One, you know, my equipment back then wasn't great. And really, there wasn't a lot of knife making equipment back mm. then. It wasn't, you know, there was no forged in fire, no focus on knife making. It was really kind of a lost art. Yeah. Um, so not great equipment and then not great know-how. And um, But yeah, I mean, came, came a long ways, you know, for sure. Um, Did you, uh, when you were doing that, you talked a little bit about the other night just being, you know, being frustrated and being like, I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. Did you ever have a point where that was actually a serious consideration. Yeah. I mean, at times, because, you know, it's interesting, the group of guys that I traveled with to knife shows that, you know, Rick and all those guys, like they were rough on me for mm. sure. I mean, they, they weren't very complimentary of my work. Mm. Um, they were always like, you know, I would make something I thought was good, which looking back on it, it wasn't good, but I thought at that moment it was good. And they'd be like, yeah, you need to do this better. You need to do that better. And it like felt like I could never get a, Hey, like, Hey, that's really good. Good right. job. You know, and I mean, I'm sure looking back, they probably were like, Hey, not too bad. That's better. But like, I never, right. I never reached that. Like, yeah, that's great. And that's it. It was always like, so I, a lot of times I just felt like I couldn't, and I was always the kid of the group. Yeah. You know, I was like wanting to be one of the men, but <laughs> not like, there yet. like we were talking about, like you were saying, like when we, we talk about how we teach our kids to communicate with adults and whatnot. And it's like, if you're Brecken or if you're my boy Hank or whatever, you want to be one of the adults. You want to sit there at the table and be one of the guys, but you're still a kid. Right. Like, and you can, you can hang with them and you can converse with them and whatnot, but still you are still a kid. 
And uh, it was hard because, like, feeling like, man, I just want to be one of the guys and be respected and as there. a maker. And, but it was good because it pushed me. Like, I kept trying to get their approval. And I think I just kept pushing to, like, make something that would, like, get that, hey, good job. You know? How did you get synced up with those guys as, you know, a young kid? Well, Rick, Rick was the one that was teaching me. And That's then, your, was that your, co- is that your yeah, coach? Yeah, that was my coach. Okay, got it, right. He was the one that was teaching me. And then, you know, again, he was kind of in the beginning of his career. They were super excited about what, you know, making knives, mm-hmm. and it was new to them. And so there were several other guys that he had met, and then from all around Montana, and uh, mostly over on the eastern side of Montana. So they started going to knife shows. Well, okay. I mean... You know, it's kind of amazing, and this leads into a little bit here later into a lot of what you talk about, but, like, they loaded me up in the back of their car and hauled me to Eugene, Oregon to a knife show, you know, and I'm 14, (laughs) and I'm going with four guys I'd never met and and Rick, and it's funny, that first knife show I went to, Rick told my parents, like, hey, I can take him out, but I'm staying out there for, like, a week, so we're going to have to find him a ride home. Oh, got it. But yeah. I went to Eugene, Oregon with no ride home <laughs> as a 14 year old. And your parents were like, cool. And no cell phone. That sounds good. You know, no. It was just like, so yeah, I went to Oregon and I remember calling my mom and saying, hey, I found a ride home from this guy named Wade Coulter. Uh, he's a really nice guy. He's got long hair and a ponytail and tattoos and he smokes, but he's a really nice guy. You know, because <laughs> we were pretty straight what and narrow. What was her reaction? She's like, yeah, sounds good. Really? And yeah, because, but my parents are like, leave it to beaver like really straight and narrow you know and i was just like i don't know mom dad like he smokes and he's got long hair but as it turns out like he's became one of like my mentors and one of my best friends like the nicest guy he's a knife maker too yep okay yep and so those guys all well they ended up nicknaming our whole group the montana mafia okay and the 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 knife magazines they wrote articles about them because those guys what i what i didn't realize is none of us did at that time is I was learning from guys that were about to explode oh, on the knife scene. Is that right? And I I just got fortunate that I didn't happen to be learning from some guy making some knives in his backyard and he never went anywhere national and never like tried to get better. Right. I actually was learning from guys that were all about to be world-class knife makers in five to ten years. Really? And so I just kind of like was lucky to be on those coattails and learn everything they're learning that whole time. Um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a little bit of luck and then just a lot of, you know, hard work and diligence, even at a young age. Yeah. And you know, people say there's no such thing as luck. I mean, maybe not, but I, I feel like, like you say there, I was definitely fortunate. I don't know. And, and I, and I I feel like I was definitely lucky. Like, like I said, there were some other knife makers around here locally mm-hmm. that never went to a single national show, and their knives never, literally, haven't gotten better in twenty five years. Really? They just do what they do. Right? They're not interested in the world out there, and they're not exposed to new ideas or new ways of doing things. And a lot yeah. of times, we just get stuck in our ruts, right? Yeah. And you, you and I talk about this a little bit, and it's kind of some of this stuff. A lot of the stuff you talk about about you know, men guiding young, young men and all that kind of stuff. And you look back on it, you know, my dad, definitely man's man for sure, but he was in excavation. That's what he did. He, mm-hmm. he didn't hunt and he didn't make knives and stuff, but he could weld and whatever, but he ran backhoes and excavators and dump trucks. And I learned a ton. I mean, I just dug footings for my new shop mm-hmm. based on knowledge I learned as a kid. Like I learned a ton, put my own septic system in and doing my, building my own roads and my pond. Like you've seen what I've done around here. That all came from my dad, but all this knife making and all my hunting experience all came from other men in the town I lived in, hmm. you know, and that's, that's something to keep in mind. And even for myself, I, I was like, man, I need to pay attention like to some of my son's friends. And is there a kid? And I didn't even, I wasn't even in that situation of like single mom or, or a bad home life, like right. I had the, the best. But I still had a dad and parents that didn't do some of the stuff that I like to do. So by having other men in that town that, you know, like bow hunting, my uncle and a couple of random guys in town that just, I would ask all the time about hunting and they're like, hey, come with. Come with us. And I started hunting with them. That's You just don't see that as much anymore outside of maybe youth sports. 
Yeah. Or maybe Boy Scouts, which is not, not really a thing anymore. Right. Um, you just, you just don't see men stepping up in that way. I mean, unfortunately you don't even see men stepping up in their, in their own families, right. Let alone in their communities, trying to serve other young men who are coming behind them. Yep. It's no, really and, unfortunate. And honestly, youth sports is what led to all of this right here was little league baseball. Right. And I'm in Mon- I was in, in Montana. Like nobody comes out of here and plays professional baseball. I mean, it's snowy here nine months out of the year, <laughs> but what came out of baseball was that connection to him. Right. And, and which led to all this, you know, it's pretty cool. Did you, did you only want to make knives or have you, or do you want to make, cause I, well, you tell me, so you have a, a you, you call yourself a knife maker. Yep. And then there's, you know, somebody like a, a, a blacksmith or a bladesmith. Yeah. Right? What, the, what's forging, the, the forging version, the forging knife making version of a, of a guy who forges is a bladesmith. Okay. A blacksmith makes gates and stair, stair railings. Got and it. Whatever. Got you it. Know. Okay. Um, it, you know, the, the local town blacksmith back in the old days fixed anything, Everything wagon metal, wheels, right? whatever. <laughs> yeah, metal. sure. Yeah. You know, a bladesmith or maybe in the real old old days, you know, like a swordsmith was, mm. you know, outfitting, you know, the army with swords or whatever. But um, <clears throat> no, I consider myself a bladesmith, you know, but that's my Josh Smith knives part of my business. Right. The custom knife making that I did for full time for about 10 years. And that's everything I did as a kid growing up. Right. Um, transitioning into Montana Knife Company with this business it's it's more of a a semi or a full on production knife making business where i am not hand forging every single knife it's not right. possible but i'm able to produce knives of the same quality at less of a price where the average guy can afford to buy one for him and his three boys where if it's a custom from me you know you're you're spending way too much money and then people don't want to use them right you know? Uh, but a lot of the knowledge that I learned in that custom knife making world, heat treating and a lot of the construction techniques and stuff, I'm I'm applying to the MKC stuff. Did you ever, or do you still do, wrestle with it knowing that you make these incredible, and I've you know seen them and seen pictures of them this week, incredible custom knives, and then over here on this side, now we make production type knives mm-hmm. and and I'm not saying it sacrifices quality but was there any sort of weirdness in your head about that about making that transition cuz there's probably not, like purists right yeah there is and not so much because I I named the company something else mm. if I start if I was making custom knives forever and then I just started slipping in CNC milled handles and CNC milled blades or laser cut blades. And I wasn't telling people or I was trying to go under the same name. And then people are like, Hey, what's this or what's that? Where's the distinction? But, um, I I'm really proud of the brand that we're building on the MKC side, but Mm -hmm. I would never call that a handmade or a custom knife. Got it. You know, it's a production knife. Um, but again, it's built on so much more knife making knowledge and experience than, pretty much any production knife company out there. Yeah, because I could always go to some company and say, here's a shape I want, you know, just punch it all out of out of some metal and put my logo on it. Like, I could probably do that. Most <laughs> knife companies start with a guy that's actually really good, like a cat on a computer. Mm. And they can design a knife on a computer. Sure. And then they can just call some shops, some CNC machine shops or, you know, whatever, fi- find the right places and send them the program and say, hey, this, this is the tolerances I want. This is what I want. What I'm calling out on all my parts. Get them, and then they just assemble them, right? And send them out. But they have no real knowledge or basis of making custom knives on what's good edge geometry, what's a good grind, what steel should I use, and why, and how should we heat treat it. You know, that's the stuff where I think uh, people are seeing a bit of a difference when they use our MKC knives. There are some slight differences that do make a big difference, you know, in the end. I mean, you wouldn't know as a novice like myself, I would, I wouldn't look at it and know, I just know it functions really well, Right. but it's always interesting. And I think this is the same with whether it's your industry or mine or whatever industry it is, is that it's those little things that the end user can't tell, but there's just something different about it. Yep. And they don't get to see everything that goes on behind the scenes and you're seeing it making the knife you're making so 
you know, if I was just a designer and I did stuff on a, a computer, a CAD computer, and I sent stuff out, and we made the same knives we're making with MKC, but then you came here to make a knife with me, we might take the parts and just assemble something. Right. But you're seeing, you know, when when you're grinding a blade and then I'm taking it and I'm grinding it a little bit different or adjusting mm-hmm. something or the heat treating stuff we do, you're and you're seeing, like, there's a basis of knowledge and kind of a depth there that... It's like, oh, okay, MKC is based in more than just some designs or a <laughs> right. computer program. Like, there's actual knowledge behind that that goes deep. That honestly, like this week, you're just getting like the tip of the iceberg on. There's sure. so much more to it. So, <clears throat> when you started Montana Knife Company, you, so I just want to understand the timeline. So, you were doing uh, knife making for about 10 years yep. professionally. Like that was your full-time gig. Yep. And then you got it, got into, uh, you became a lineman, right? Yep. So what, what made that transition? Why did you stop making knives full-time and move into that? Yeah. And I, I think a lot of your listeners, <clears throat> you know, I, I think a lot of my story should resonate with a lot of your listeners because there's a lot of, when I hear you talk, it's a lot of like, yep, I went through that. Right. And so, you know, I, I was fortunate. Most 99% of your listeners aren't going to have maybe the path that I had from like 11 to to 25 or 30 years old. Yeah, they're old. not going to have that foundation. Yeah. So I, I came out of high school, went to college for a, you know, a year. My heart wasn't in it. Frankly, I didn't plan on being a full-time knife maker at that point. Mm-hmm. I was going to take my dad's construction business over because it was so such a good business. But frankly, the knife making part was just like burning in me. Like, I got to try this full time. Like, and guys are like, it's a hard living. And I'm like, yeah, but I can do it. I right. can, you know? And so I went to college, duck hunted my way out of college <laughs> <laughs> first semester. <laughs> um, you know, so I came back, went to work for my folks for a year, um, ended up getting married. And as soon as we got married and got a home loan, we moved here to Frenchtown I quit my, I was working for an excavation guy here in Missoula. <laughs> right as you picked up the house. Like we I'm signed, done. we signed on our house and the next day I quit my job. Really? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going full time making knives, you know, but I needed that income, you know, for the banker to see. Yeah. What and was so, your, like, what was your wife like at that point about it? Um, she was supportive of okay. it from what I remember. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we, uh, I went into making knives full time and honestly it went really well. You know, I was full time for about 10 years but it's a hard, it's a hard way to make a living. You know, we started having babies, I ended up having four kids and still I was doing pretty dang good. And I had a few year backlog and I was going to shows and selling out. And I was honestly getting a really na- nationally recognized name for sure. I mean, I was going as well as it can go from pretty much any knife maker. Hmm. And then 2008, you know, that economy started happening. And oh yeah. And you got to realize, like, my knives were between two and $10,000 a piece. Well, all of a sudden, we we head into this recession. And if you watch the news, they were talking depression. Right. Like, this could be... Right. It was a big deal. This could be, you know, the, dir- you know, the dirty 30s again. And so I, uh, I was like, man, I was just struggling. And I was teaching this guy to make knives in my shop. And he's telling me about his power company job. He was a welder for mm-hmm. the, on the gas side. 401k yeah. pension eight to 430 making 40 bucks an hour and just like no stress you know but just go to work do your job 430 you're done you go fishing go do whatever and i'm like man i'm i'm out here grinding like long hours i'm working saturdays and sundays and then if i work on something and i screw it up i lose all that time you know it's it's all it was a lot to manage and i was like i could just make the knives i want to make with no stress and have a full-time job Mm, and just do the knives on the side. Yeah. And honestly, more than anything, it was the economy and the fact that I was nervous with four kids that I wouldn't be able to provide. Mm. That was my biggest fear. But was that, but that didn't sound like it was an issue really. It it sounded like it was becoming an issue right then because my three year backlog went to about three months. It felt like in about a a month, like I started calling people. Yeah. And so like, hey, we're just going into this recession, and people are saying, well, I, I want to hold off on that order. You know, I don't know. Like, things are tight. My stocks are down or whatever. Right. And so I'm like, I was mo- mostly, like, anticipating the future and mm-hmm. listening to the news and, like, wow, if it gets worse, I'm going to have no orders. 
and I have a chance to take a job here, be guaranteed I can provide for my family. And I was getting a little burned out, and I had this idea of Montana Knife Company forever. Oh, so I, you've been thinking about that for a long yes. time. Yes. I registered the name Montana Knife Company when I was 19. Oh, really? Yeah. With and you the started idea. it when you were, what, 38, 39? 30. Or I'm, I'm 30, uh, 39. 39, <clears throat> okay. So I, 20 years. Yeah. I waited to start it. But I knew my personal life, it was tough with young kids and my ex and stuff. And then I also knew I, I didn't have enough cash really to start it. And I, I just knew I'd have one shot. Mm-hmm. And I, I had a, a friend of mine that he was kind of a marketing guy that kept encouraging me to do it. And I was just like, I got, I, things have to be right. Like for years we talked about it and I was like, I, I, I can't do it right now. And so I took that power company job um, applied and actually got on there operating backhoe for them. Um, on the gas side, I was going to be a welder. And I really quickly realized when I got hired on there, looking around the room, all the old guys were linemen and they were all retiring. Oh, yeah. And so There's sure enough, apprenticeships came up and I switched over to the electric side and I got an apprenticeship and uh, went through a lineman apprentice and became a lineman. And honestly, I loved it. It was a great, it was a great job and it was a big stress relief from the standpoint of... Um, it just every day you go to work, it's just there. Right. The money comes in, you know. It, it, you could clock out. You yep. don't have to think about it when you're yep. done. Um, but I will say over that 10 years, I was really missing being my own boss. I was I didn't have any control really of my own destiny. There was mm. definitely a ceiling that I just wasn't okay with. Like, I feel like I can do better. I can do more. And I want to do this company. Right. And so... You know, in that time period there, I'd gotten divorced and things were rough personally for a little while. And just like, man, like there was no knife making. Like I was coming home from work and washing clothes and folding clothes and taking kids to this and that. And I wasn't making knives. There was no time. And and frankly, what really changed was I met my my new wife, Jessica. And, um, you know, we started dating and that kind of took off and went well and we got married and I was telling her about this company I wanted to start. And she's just like, well, let's do it. Like you should quit your job like right now. Really? Like, and I'm like, well, hold on. <laughs> like, I can't just quit. I mean, for a couple of years, she's like, you should just do this, like quit. And That's I was like, amazing. well, I, you know, as a man, you have responsibilities for your family of and paying your bills. That's and I'm priority. Like, yes. I want to quit my job, but I don't feel like I can. Hmm. So I built some prototypes, uh, and that's really when I met you at Winter Strong yes. at Sornex. I took uh, those prototypes, and, and I went out there, and I showed a bunch of those guys, you you guys out there. And uh, I was like, hey, this is a company I'm thinking of starting. And everybody, you know how that group is. Of Everybody's course. just like super, super supportive. supportive. Yeah. Hey, man, we got your back. That'll be cool. You know, Casey at Tacticalories and all these different guys were just like, yeah, you should do this. It'd be awesome. And so through those people, I actually met Brandon, my business partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, they introduced me here in Montana and he came down, took some photos and started, I was paying him to do some work. And he was, I was like, man, this guy's good mm-hmm. at what he does, like marketing stuff. He built my website and so over that summer, well, now we're also diving straight head on into a pandemic. Right, right, right. That's Another 2020. Good time to yeah. Get so into this business that was February of 2020. <laughs> Throughout that time, by J- July 4th, he launched my website. Went to uh, Total Archery Challenge again. Showed some knives around. Showed John Dudley, and I'm, he, I'm sure he was like, "Yeah, that's cool. Good job." You know, under the next guy. Right. You know, but I met right. you know, JP with Big Chino and. Cole Kramer and just a lot of people there. And I just started saying like, Hey, I'm launching this company and I had a website and we started selling a few. Right. And, uh, I started realizing that like later that summer, like Brandon was really good and, but I can't afford to pay him what I need to really market this. Mm -hmm. So I offered him partnership in the company and, uh, long story short, he took that became a partner and like things started kind of taking off and really it was getting so busy. And Jess just kept telling me, when are you going to commit to this? Like, yeah. Cause you were still doing the other job. I was job. still a lineman. Okay. Got it. And I was pissing those guys off at work because I'm like trying to take phone calls to deal with oh, yeah. order and steal or talking to, you know, uh, whoever about right. whatever. And, 
the kind of a funny story of what made, and I haven't told you this, but what really made the decision just, just kept saying like, there's something here. Mm-hmm. Like this is building. She like, saw you, it. you need to quit. And it was more of that. Like I wanted to so bad, but man, I'm making a hundred grand a year and there's no, like this job will be here forever. And this other thing I'm building is completely unknown, like completely. And it's, and we're not making enough money to survive off of it at this point at all, Mm -hmm. you know? And so sure enough, I'm out of vacation. I'd gone and done some events and whatnot. And it's coming down to the end of the year. And Thomas Rhett sends us a message and he's like, Hey, I'm up in Montana. want to meet, um, like what you guys are doing. Would love, love to meet and say hi and have a knife. And I'm, it's a great connection. Big country music star, you know, and, um, he's down a few hours from here at big sky skiing. And so, this was like two weeks in advance. I asked my boss, I'm like, Hey, I'm out of vacation, but I need December 30th off last day of the year or second to last day. I'm out of vacation. Take it out of next year's. It really literally rolls over January 1st. The next two days, big corporation. Well, you're out of vacation. Okay. Well, I need that day off, (laughs) like no pay or however you want to do it. Right. I'm like, think about it. And he's just like, okay. And getting closer and a couple days ahead of it, I'm like, hey, did you figure it out? No, no, you you know, you don't have the vacation. And so I walk in there the day before I was supposed to go down to see Thomas on the 31st. And I was like, hey, did you figure that out? And he's like, no, man, you're out of vacation. Uh, I was like, all right, well, I'll be, I'll be done at noon. <laughs> is that, and you quit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, How did he take that? He's like, what? <laughs> And I was like, man, I told you, like, this is a super important and like, I, I need, I need to be done. Right. And my wife, I, we had sat in the hot tub that night before we do a lot of our talking in the hot tub about planning life. And <laughs> she's like, you just need to quit. And I was like, yeah. And I was feeling, I'm like, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. But I was just still like unsure. And finally I was just like standing there in his office. I'm like, I'll go do this job that's planned. I don't want to screw you yeah, over. Yeah, you don't want to hose them. Yeah. And I had asked him, like, hey, could I take, like, a sabbatical, like, unpaid, like, leave of absence for six months, Mm -hmm. figure out this company, is it going to go or not? And now we can't do that. And I was like, well, just so you know, like, you're really pushing me to a corner where I I might have to quit at some point. So I'd kind of warned him. But then it just came down to, like, look, you know... If we can't work together on this or there's no, which that's how corporations work. Of course. They don't care about what else you have going on. No, I'm a number. Yeah. Ultimately. And, uh, so I was like, I'll be done at noon. So I went and did the job, came back, handed him my keys, walked, you know, we, they, you know, it was all good. It wasn't a, yeah, you it wasn't a bad, you didn't like, like blow out of there. No. Head. And they, they told me like, good luck. And if you know, you need your job back, like. You know, I was a good employee, so right. it wasn't it wasn't bad. How did it feel when when you left, like that drive home? Like I was gonna puke. That's what I was like. <laughs> was it like a range of emotions? Was it only like that was a mistake? What was that? No, like? not a mistake, but definitely just like holy shit, here we go. This is real now. This is real. Got it. Like, and then also the sense of freedom, of like it felt like like you'd been shackled for like. 10 straight years with this dream. And then it was just like a rocket is in your ass <laughs> <laughs> and you have to make it work. And, and it, but it felt like, like here we freaking go, like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. We're going to do this. And it was just like, no excuses now, no holding back. There is no time clock anymore. Like it's 24 seven. Let's, let's roll. And honestly, that was the moment when like, it just took off mm. because it was just like full on you commitment. You could pour everything into it. Poured into it. Brandon and I didn't take a paycheck, I think, for the next six months. Um, I didn't have a ton of savings, but I had some. And Jess and I just kind of was watching our savings dwindle a little bit. But, you know, I always knew I could make a custom knife. I mean, hell, I could, I could do about anything. If I needed to go drive dump truck Do for some a week, work on the side, right. I, I sure. could do whatever. Yeah. Um. And again, I didn't risk it all. Like I, the great thing about the trades, if you're a plumber, a lineman, or whatever, you can quit and you can move a thousand miles away and find a job. There's always work. There's work somewhere. Mm-hmm. It's so it's not like I quit something that was impossible to find again. But um, so there is that safety net to a degree. 
Yeah, um, I mean there is, but I, I felt the same way with my finance when I sold my financial planning practice. Yeah, when I was doing order met, very similar story. Um, but Trish was like, I don't know, if she wasn't yeah. quite the same as Jess was with yeah. it. Uh, but the minute I did the deal, oh man! And you know what? That was when order man started to skyrocket. Yeah. Because you can invest and put all that time instead of having to spread it out among a bunch of different places and people and yep. things. It's like one singular pursuit. Yep. No, and that's, you know, that that first quarter we, you know, we just, and honestly, we built this. We didn't have investors. Brandon didn't put any money into it. It's not mm. like he came in with a bunch of cash or we, we what we sold, we took and we put back in the company. We didn't take a check. Right. And we just kept. Okay, we made 200 knives, now we're going to make 300. Or now we're now we're going to introduce another model and we're going to take all the money we have and we're going to dump it into the speed goat. Yeah. You know, and we're going to order 200 speed goats. We're going to sell them and now we're going to make 400. And we just built honestly like the old school way. And again, we also I also quit a around here a relatively high paying job with benefits and sure. all that in the middle of a freaking pandemic, like <laughs> yeah. kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah. I'm you maybe, but you know, it's I, only stupid if it doesn't work. Right. I, I do feel, and I've listened later in the pandemic. I listened to even like people like Andy Frisilla and he mm. was like, there's people that are going to sit on the sideline and be like, well, we're going to hunker in. We're going to pull in. We're just going to kind of watch. And then there's going to be people that go. Right. And like, and I took that attitude. I, in the last recession in 08, pulled in. In fact, I pulled in so far, like I, I went so safe that I literally quit what I was doing when I was really reaching a point where I felt like I was becoming one of the biggest names in the in the world and making knives. Yeah. And I had a lot of opportunity coming that had I stuck with it, I probably would have done just you fine. Been great. Yeah, would have been great. Sure. Um, I was utilizing the internet like a lot of older guys weren't. I was collecting email addresses and I was doing a lot of stuff, business stuff that would have done well. But I, but I listened to the news and I, and I kind of, kind of, I, I did what I thought I needed to do for my family, which I'm proud of, but I also in a way a little bit pushed out, you know, I, I took maybe the easy route, um, for sure the easier route from, but it wasn't easy. I mean, I'm walking away from everything I love. To go be yeah. the low man on the totem pole to have to get an apprenticeship and fight my way back to the top in that industry. Because, um, you know, as a groundman, as a as a lineman, I mean, you're just, you're treated like shit. You know, you're just, of course, it doesn't matter if you're, you're the 39. Peon, you got to go do yeah. all the crap work yeah, and everything Yeah, which else. is how it should be. Right. You got to earn your you're stripes. You got to get there. Sure. It's like if you want to become a Navy SEAL and you enter it late and you're 32, they don't care. You're still yep. a new guy. Right. Um, it's got to feel good now knowing that, well, let, let me ask you this way, because with the growth that you guys have experienced with Montana knife company, it's, it's, it's been astronomical mm -hmm. in a sh very short period of time. And it's, a, it's not common. Right. So what do you attribute that growth and success to in that short period of time? I mean, you could say, well, we, we make good knives and that's not wrong. Right. But there's more to it than that. Well, a lot of it, a lot of it is Brandon and the marketing stuff that he does. Uh, um, and a lot of it is, I think, the particular state of our world where we're making stuff in America and we're standing by our, our values and we're saying kind of what we believe in. And there's a lot of companies that are big companies that are kind of going woke and running away from what they believe in. And we're just like, no, this is what we believe in. We believe in you know, fund the police and we believe in our military and our veterans and, um, you know, American made and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think some of it's that, I think a lot of it is my, I had a pretty big basis of respect for my knowledge and stuff. And that, that added some serious credibility in the MKC world. Right. And then a ton of it is just our network of people of great humans from, I don't care if it's a marketing person at Leopold or at Trigger or if it's a um, or at Eberly Stock or, you know, if it's Glenn Eberly himself mm. or Bert Soren. I mean, name, you know, name the name. There's dozens um, of people who it's what a network of people can do if you support each other and right. lift each other up. They shared our stuff. You know, we got to play as a tiny, tiny knife company, basically 
making no money early on in a world of like big boys. Right. Like they let us kind of hang. We weren't a big, big name. Uh, but a lot of those people believed in like who we were. And, but a lot of that I think was just that networking piece and that, that meeting people and shaking people's hands. And so many owners of companies hire people to do the stuff for them mm. where I went to total archery challenge myself, Brandon and I went ourselves. We go to winter strong and we make the phone calls ourselves. And, and then also I was making the knives myself in the shop too, mm. you know? Uh, so when you start a business, you're going to have to do it all. Right. You know, if, right. You're, if you're starting a business, you can't just go hire a marketing director um, I also think I was one of the smartest things I ever did was admitting what I don't know. And, and I made some of those mistakes when I was a custom knife maker, not mistakes, but like I didn't hire somebody to do marketing stuff for me. I tried right. to do everything myself. Well, I should be making knives. I'm a knife maker. Mm. Um, but I knew I had to get creative, like with Brandon. Okay. I can't afford to pay this guy much, paid him a little bit initially to take some pictures. But I told my wife, like, we can't afford to pay him. So we got to figure this out. And he asked, he's like, when I offered him partnership, he's like, you thinking like 80, 20, 70, 30, you know, 90, 10. And I was like, no, I'm sure he thought I was going to say less. And I was like, no, like 60, 40. Mm. He's like, really? Like I literally was willing to give him 40% of my company. Granted, there wasn't a lot of a company there, (laughs) right? But I was willing to give that up because I told him, I need you to be invested. Yeah. Like, I need you to care. And if this does take off, you're going to do well. You know, if he just still only had 10% of what we're doing today, like still, how much would he really be? Yeah, I mean, it? he'd be doing other things and, you know, he'd be committed <laughs> to something else. And it would he quit his job. Probably really wouldn't feel like his business. Yep. Yeah. And he quit. He had, he had previously, before I quit mine, he had quit his job because he was building his own marketing business on the side. Mm-hmm. But as we took, took off, he started to let that slip away and, and, and kind of shed clients and spend more time on what we were doing. If he only had 90, 10, he'd have had to keep that going. Of course. Yeah. Um, and then and he, then he wouldn't have been this. committed. Right. You know, um, but I think, you know, with this pandemic stuff that was happening, like. That whole idea of, man, shut the damn TV off and quit watching the news. Like, believe in what you're doing and then go after it with, like, blinders on. Now, you got to be smart, obviously. You can't do stupid stuff. But um, had I just said, like, well, we're going into a pandemic and I'm just going to wait for a year. I'm going to keep that lineman job another year. You know, we felt like the iron was hot and we had to strike it. Yeah. And it, and you can't like you when you were forging out there. You can't let it cool down. You got to do it when it's hot. Like you can make moves. You can make that steel move when it's hot. Right. And there's only you can tell people, I'm gonna do this for only so long, and then they're gonna be like, Yeah, he's not gonna do it. Well, you and I mean, yes, you're. There's that, and also you undermine credibility with other people too. Right. If I'd have gone to three winter strongs right. with prototypes. And never did anything like, with all it. Right, bro. People be like, oh yeah, Josh is nice guy. That's it. Right. You're not gonna commit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But no, like I think that's one thing they respected. Well, I went to Winter Strong of twenty twenty, and when I went back to twenty twenty one, we were a sponsor. That's right. I was supposed to go and my flight I got had like three or four flights canceled and I couldn't make it in twenty one. A bunch of guys that year yeah, it was rough that snowstorms year. everywhere. Yeah. But we Granted, we weren't a sponsor, like we weren't giving them 50 grand, but we were, we donated knives to the event. We'd given, you know, paid a little bit of money. We had a banner and it's like, literally we're standing there a year earlier with prototypes prototypes. saying like, Hey, this is what I'm thinking of doing. I don't have a website. As it turns out, I didn't have a website for about six more months, (laughs) but like, this is my idea. And then 12 months later we walk, we drive in and on the, you know, on the trapper's cabin is our Montana knife right. company banner hanging there. Yeah. It's got to feel know. good. Yeah. And then this year again, we're even more of a sponsor and, um, you know, those guys are great cause you know, they're letting us sponsor at the level we can and mm-hmm. helping us grow. And, um, and yeah, now we are, win. we're sponsoring, you know, a total archery challenge and, you know, like, uh, 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 uh stuff going on at those events and black rifle coffee or like the, uh, adaptive athlete shoot happening next week. Yeah, you know, a couple weeks, we're donating, um, 
you know, 60 knives to that uh, for all the adaptive athletes. So it's pretty cool to this quickly be able to be also giving back, you know. Well, I, I think that's probably part of the appeal. Not, not that it's a, a strategy necessarily. I mean, there's nothing wrong with strategy, but you're, you're not trying to manipulate that. Like you genuinely are that way. Right. That you care about people, you care about the community, you care about the people you serve. And, and I think that that's probably what comes across that it's not just like you were saying earlier about being a, a, a number or being a worker like, Oh, cause I even see it with the three people that I met here, you know, they're yeah. in here sharpening knives, packing knives. They're going to send out a bunch of orders today. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's like they, you could see they're all, they're happy. They want to be here. Yeah. They want to be part of this. Yeah. They're excited to be on the team and, uh, you know, and I couldn't, you know, again, couldn't do all this. Now I, I do way less of the work and I'm much more of like trying to figure out where we're going from here, but they're, they're crushing it in here. Yeah. They work hard. You see, I don't have to manage them. No. I mean, they doing, do their thing, doing their thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really cool. And I, you know, the whole giving back thing, like it's one thing that I always admired and I, and I was watching the whole time as a lineman, like I watched black rifle coffee, do what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I always thought it was so dang cool when I saw them being able to write checks or do stuff. You know, we put on a veterans event here last year where we flew in like 22 veterans to Montana to learn how to forge. Yeah, and that's awesome. And I think that kind of stuff is just super cool. And when I saw brands doing that, I'm like, man, I want to have a brand someday where I can like really like affect some change or help people. And um, I think we've done some of that for sure already. So it's cool. For sure. Well, then it's got to feel good. We were at dinner last night and you just had that knife drop. Yeah. And your wife was teasing you because you think it's, it jinxes it when you say how quickly they're going to sell out. Yeah. Which it doesn't because yeah. her and I were making predictions. Yeah. And we were, I was telling them to be quiet. We were way <laughs> off. We like, I thought we were overestimating, you know, how quickly they would go. Yeah. We even we were way off. She was yeah. way off. <laughs> yeah, it happened fast. It was like two minutes. Yeah. So how does how does that feel when you see that? Is that? I mean, obviously you're excited about that, but what else? Is, are there nerves? Like, are we gonna keep being able to do this? Like, oh man, it it always just feels like like man, at any point it could just stop because like right. when you dream of something so long and you put so much effort in, you also worry about you know, the economy and you worry like, okay, is this going to grow old on people or, um, you, you know, but there are, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of people out there and, you know, we're selling hundreds of knives. So there's definitely more people, but it, it when you, when you're so passionate about something, you just worry about it too. Right. You know, you just, I do, I worry. How do you deal with that from a, from like a strategic level of, because I imagine that's a consideration is like, okay, well, what are we going to do to evolve? What are we going to do to advance? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, that's probably, I, I tell, I've told some people here lately, like 99% of my stress and worry is about nothing that's happening today. Mm -hmm. It's about what we're going to do tomorrow. Right. Uh, you know, how do we grow? How do we expand and, and scale? But then also new new designs. How do we become, you know, innovative? What, what do people want or need? So... Um, honestly, it's just kind of a daily grind and it, it's like, how do you eat the elephant? It's kind of one bite at a time, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I'm taking that approach. It's, I do, you know, ask some questions and lean on some people that, you know, I've asked Evan Hay for some stuff, you know, I've asked, you know, Bert Soren or people I respect that are doing some things at a large scale. Um, but we also are going to have to find some people and hire some people that have been there and done that at some large companies and, and help us scale. Cause again, I'm, I'm really literally just a regular guy that was a lineman two years ago. Now <laughs> trying to figure out how to build, you know, a multi, multi million dollar building and facility and equipment. And I think that's know. one of the things that so many men resonate with. Cause there's a lot of guys who listen to the podcast or, you know, who I talk with who, you know, maybe even linemen, you know, and they're, and they're doing work and, they're, they're making money and they're putting food on their table and you should do that because like you said earlier, you have responsibilities, but they just feel something back here yep. that's calling to them and they, yep. they don't quite know maybe what it is or what to do. And so when they hear a story like yours or even mine to a degree, it gives them a little bit of hope that, Oh, well maybe I can do that. And they should, they should, they should absolutely do that. But I, and I see people, they're like, 
I, I have people tell me like, well, I'm thinking of quitting my job and like making knives or, or whatever, right. do, doing whatever that, whatever the thing, the thing is. is. Yeah. And I ask him like, well, okay, what are you, what are you doing now? Like, what, where's it, where's it all at? Well, I haven't really started anything. It's like, you should probably keep your job. Like you should I, probably start is what I say. I, exactly. <laughs> do that. Like that's where you, if you want to do this, you're going to have to do both jobs for a while at the same time right. until you just literally can't do it anymore. Right. I mean, um, you're going to have to skip going to the lake on Saturday or skip going to the bar, save that money or, or maybe sell your brand new fancy truck. And like when I got divorced in 2012, I, I pulled some favors from some couple guys. Like I borrowed some money from some knife collectors cause I couldn't go to the bank to get it. And, yeah. and was like, I'll pay you back. And a couple guys that were like dads to me that had been buying knives forever that were very wealthy men, but loaned me money. And then I quickly was able to get kind of get back on my feet and then went and borrowed money from a bank when I couldn't pay them back. Right. But I, and I'm saying all that stuff because like I was broke as hell. I was a single dad. Now I didn't have time to be in my shop. I was just trying to be a dad at night. And you, you have to figure out like people have to understand that like my story isn't because like I had a bunch of money or I had some huge advantage, like I work my ass off and mm -hmm. people can do it, but you, you have to, you have to figure it out while you also have that other job for a little while. Yeah. Um, well the thing is, and this is like the really romanticized version is you'll hear people say, just burn all the boats and just right. like, that sounds awesome. That's not what I did. And it's actually reckless. If you've got kids and a wife and a mortgage and a this and a that, to yeah. just burn all that to the ground because you have a dream, like yep, cool. I but then, that but work then, realistically, you're right. But then again, people also then use the kids and the wife and all that That's stuff all as an excuse. And and so you're a hundred percent right. There's a balance in there between you can't just burn the boats when you get a you wake up with a wild hair, um, um. But you also can't just continue to use all them as an excuse when really a lot of times you're sitting around all day Sunday watching football. <laughs> yeah, like. Put a, a lot of time, maybe just on the internet, just studying, like studying, asking questions, learning, uh, you know, building whatever you're going to build, like learning about how it's run and how to run a business. And well, what um, I like what you did is, and, and I think this is the route is go, go sell some shit. Yeah. Like if you want to do something good, go sell something. Cause not only are you going to learn if it's viable, you're going to build your confidence cause you mm -hmm. actually sold something. And so you did, you know, you took your prototypes, you built it. Yep. And then you took them and people were like, oh yeah, I want that. I'll yep. buy those. Yep. Got it. So you just proved your idea will work. Yep. You actually move the needle. Yeah. And also you, you got to stick with your dream like this. Like I say, I incorporate, I uh, registered my name with the state of Montana when I was 19 mm. and I launched when I was 39. Hmm. So if you really actually believe in what you're doing and it doesn't happen in the next year, that's, that's probably the norm. Like you got to stay with it. You got to continue. Maybe you use all that time while you're trying to figure out, you know, saving up money to get your prototypes or to get the machine you need to build what you're going to do or, or whatever. Um, I see so many people they'll borrow <clears throat> at what's a new pickup now, 50 grand, 60 grand, yeah. 70 grand, yeah, 50 on the low side. And you see people they'll borrow that, but they won't go borrow money for a CNC machine. Maybe a, a, a cheaper one. That's 30 grand. That's a really good point. <clears throat> You know, That's a so really good point. Go think about what you're borrowing. When I got divorced, the the pickup I bought from my foreman at work was like a 1991 long box, like crew cab, like pile of shit. <laughs> and man, I mean, it definitely you don't have an ego driving around because it was a it was a hunk of crap. Stranded me on Lolo Pass with my kids. <laughs> I had to have my buddy come get me and have it towed. <laughs> like, but I was doing everything I could to not be in like crazy debt. Right. And be able to put, once this started, like put all your money and your effort and whatnot behind it, you know? And a lot of that kind of equipment, if you're, if you're a guy that maybe it's a welder, you just want to buy a welder and start welding at night. You know, there's trades, not everybody's going to start a knife company, but maybe you don't like what you're doing or you're, let's say you're working at McDonald's and but you know, a welder and the average welder is making seventy to a hundred grand a year, mm -hmm. and you want to be a welder. But nobody's taught you how to weld. Well, 
spend a bunch of time researching it. Yeah, I mean, research the YouTube, hell out of it. YouTube. Yep. And then borrow the money and buy a welder and start, go down to the scrap yard and buy a bunch of scrap for scrap price, weld all that shit together, and then go back to the scrap yard and sell it back to the scrap yard. Mm. <laughs> and, and start teaching yourself how to weld, you know, um, you, you, you don't necessarily, that, that, you know, you can start then picking up side jobs, welding stuff for people, or, or go find a welder that you can then work for. And maybe all, you know, like our guys at work, when they learn to weld, all they do right in the beginning is grind out the welds for the actual welder. Mm. But then he'll say, like, see this weld, see this yeah, crack. Yeah, he's teaching them as they're going. Yep. And then they'll let you start like, hey, you make the first pass, then we'll weld, we'll grind it out, and I'll finish it. Right. And the next thing you know, you're a welder. You know, it's stuff like that you can do. There's so many great trades. And that, you know, it's hard. I feel it's it's a struggle for people who are graduating high school right now. And you're looking at the price of college and what people are getting paid with a college degree. Yeah. Man, the trades out there, the lineman jobs, the welding, the plumbing, like great jobs, you know. I feel like a lot of times guys won't do these types of things because they don't have the vision for the future and they they're they're feeling like it has to be bigger than it is like if i'm going to start we'll just use knives if i'm going to start making knives then i have to do it as quickly and efficiently and, and good as montana knife company did right or you know benchmade or or buck knife or whatever like some yeah. of the other big huge knife companies right yep and so they're like well but yeah i can't do that so i won't do anything it's like you you got to you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Dude, we're like a fly on elephant's ass at Benchmade. But do I do I want to like take a run at them and be as big as them? Like hell yeah. Now, yeah, man. I don't know if I'll ever get even close, but if we even get like halfway there, it's a pretty damn good company. Um it's just amazing that people won't just give it a shot and mm. go for it. And again, like you see what we're sitting in literally kind of a glorified garage right now it's <laughs> right. A, it's it's a really nice garage if it was just your garage at your house pretty sweet little garage to yeah. have but it's not a giant production facility <laughs> yeah and you you know you see the hole out back that we've got dug that we're about to to build a building we're doing that again we're we're, we're being creative we're building that back there because it's on my property we can kind of do it somewhat inexpensive we don't have to buy the land right and that's our next step. We're not trying to build Benchmade's building. Yeah, in you didn't Missoula. go from two years ago like, hey, I'm just going to build a shot. It's like, no, we're going to do it in our own place that we have right now. Throw a few walls up, yep. put some drywall up, and, yep, and we'll just deal with it like that. Yep, and 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 you know, we we could we could try to go to a bank right now and go buy a commercial piece of property in Missoula and build this huge building. We'd be so far in debt yeah. that all of our money would probably go to just servicing that loan. Right. And we wouldn't be able to buy equipment or hire people. Um, the other thing that's cool too is I imagine, I, I know I have, like you're going to look back. Actually, Jess and I, I think we're talking about it with shipping. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about what has to go out today. And I was thinking about it with Trish. I remember <clears throat> we would release like a new hat or a new shirt or a new planner. And we would stay up for like four hours at, you know, nine to 1 a.m., just packing orders in yep. a little in our little spare bedroom in the basement, which is where I have my computer and printer. Yep. And it was like it was not totally fun, but we were also doing it together and yep. joking with each other. And the, it's like that stuff. Now that we don't do that, that's the stuff I remember. And my kids still, my my kids, my little girl Macy, my twelve year old, she loves to help package sweatshirts and hats mm -hmm. downstairs. And it's crazy. We have I haven't even taken you down there yet, but. We have um, same thing. That bedroom is just full of merchandise down there. Then our yeah. little living room area down there's got merchandise racks in it. Today, this morning, when we go in there, there'll be the whole entire basement floor will be covered with orders. Jess is laying out, right? And you know, we hired Jess. Jess quit her full time job, and I was able to hire her. She was a school teacher um, last year, right before the school year started, and. Again, she wears a lot of hats. She's customer service. She sends us an email. <laughs> she answers it. She's dealing with inventory of ordering handles and sheaths and all the stuff that we need to order, you know, and dealing with payroll with employees, packaging everything. Down the road, she'll probably find her lane and have one job because sure. it'll be big enough. But there again, 
uh, we're working together. And that's the other thing. Like if you're going to go out and do kind of what I've done, you got to have the support at home. Mm. Like, um, it's, it's also healthy though. Like in your situation where like Trish is questioning or, you know, it's not that she's not supportive, but no, she's, yeah, I've never taken it you, like that. You need, you need to have someone also, you know, question. I was the one more questioning myself. Jess was more of like, let's, let's go. We'll <laughs> do it. We'll figure it out. Um, but you do, you need, you need that support, but you, it's good too. Like Jess has been honest at times about like, or maybe I've just been like grinding too much and she's like, Hey, family needs you. Like mm. you got to dial it back here for a day. Right. And we got to go do something together. You know, you need somebody to kind of check you too, you know, um, but that support from, yeah. from home is huge, you know? Yeah. You couldn't do it without it. No. I mean, if and I, and I talk with a lot of guys who, you know, their wives aren't supportive for whatever. There's there's a myriad of reasons for that. A, a lot of the times, and I'll, I'll just put it out here like this, because a, a lot of guys think, well, my wife's just not supportive. It seems to me, based on experience, and more often than not, it's because you're not worth supporting. She might have a reason. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not trying to paint anybody as the bad guy when I say that, but when I see these scenarios, I'm like... Yeah, well, you said you were going to start three businesses and you dabbled yeah. you know, over the past 10 years and now you're saying you're going to start another business. Tell me why she would believe in yeah, that. Yeah, you're on your eighth idea. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, She if, if, if there's real, real passion there and real drive and real effort and work and she's seen like, man, he is, he is grinding. Like there will be a lot more support there mm -hmm. um, for sure. And, you know, there is, it's... It's, uh, there has to be sacrifices from everybody. Um, you know, we've, we've heard all these stories all the time. People, they, they sell their houses, they sell everything. Evan Hayford, like he, you know, to do black rifle, he said he like, he sold, he sold, he was selling everything, mm -hmm. sold all his guns, he sold everything to do black rifle. Um, and that's why I, I do have a ton of respect for, for him, and even though his company's gotten, you know, massive, we're talking billion dollar plus company that's now public, in only eight years, he did that. That's so crazy. I mean, I can't imagine being, you know, five years from today mm -hmm. and having that, you know. Mm -hmm. But what it did for me, like watching what he did and some other people, is it it makes you, like, why not me? Like, he grew up in a logging town in Idaho. Mm-hmm. He was a military, you know, guy, Green Bray, but like, why not me? Why mm -hmm. can't I do it? Um, and there is that confidence piece. Like people, you do have to have confidence in yourself. You got to man up and be like, I can do this, you know? It, so that's a weird one for me is let, let's, let's unpack that a little bit because how do you have confidence in something you've never done before? Right? Like, how, yeah. how do you, how do you feel confident knowing I can do this? But you have actually zero reason to think that because yeah. you've never done it before. I, I think really where that comes down to is I know I'm willing to work hard enough. Okay. Yeah. Like I know like whatever it's going to take. Like, And even if it did fail, I also know I was willing to work hard enough or make the sacrifices to go find another lineman job or, or, or to recover. Like I knew that even if it went all wrong, I could recover. Hmm. Um, I would do what it would took, what it took, you know? And I think as long as you know, you're willing to like, I'm going to give this everything, uh, but I'm not going to go to the point where I literally cost us everything and we lose everything. Right. Like I am, I did it one time in my life where I pulled the plug on my own dream and went and made the hard choice and kind of like, dude, I did not want to take a corporate job and walk in there and sit in there like a number and sit in safety meetings and do whatever. Like I was a knife maker at heart. Like I ran my own business for 10 years, but I felt like I just had to take one for the team and go get that job when I did would it. Would you, would you have done that differently? Like if you were to do it over knowing what you know now, do you think you still would have done that? Or do you think you would have said, no, I'm going to buckle down during this 2008, 2009 and get after it. I don't, I really honestly think right sitting here right now, I don't think I would have, I would change what I did. Like mm. I, I do think I would have been successful, but I also don't like, I've done some dumb shit in my life or I've, I've made mistakes or whatever. Like I just don't have, I don't have any regret. 
So like when I look at that, I just I think it was the right move Part at the of time. The journey. And I I thought about it a lot. It wasn't on a whim. Like I thought about it for a year. Um you know, it th- I I needed a I needed sometimes you need a reset button. And also sometimes you got to lose something for a little while to realize like how bad you want it back. And and <laughs> I wasn't my own boss for 10 years and that sucked. Yeah. And being a number, I'd never worked in a corporation. Like, quite honestly, I never really had a real job outside of that one year I moved to Missoula and worked for this guy in Missoula. But even him, he was like working for a buddy. I mean, you were build, building knives. Building knives and working for my dad. Right, yeah. Um, and man, you, you, you have that life of essentially a freedom. Um, you know, working with for my dad was fantastic. It was amazing. I learned a ton. We worked really hard. But like, I'd never really just been a number. Man, you go taste some of that shit for a while, and you're like, "Okay, I'm gonna, f- I'm gonna figure <laughs> this <that>. out." <laughs> when you you were younger, you became so. I want to make sure I get this right. The the youngest master bladesmith is that right? Yeah. And so, what is what is that, and who gets to decide? And is there some sort of accepted standard for that? Yeah. So you you join the American Bladesmith Society. Okay. You have to be an apprentice, which basically means you're a member. Sure. For three years. And, and you then, have to work under somebody? Um, not really. I mean, you're an apprentice. So they assume, especially back then, there was no YouTube. So they assume <laughs> there was you're, no working, internet. you're learning from somebody. You're learning from someone. Okay. Um, if you can just figure it all out on your own, good for you. But <laughs> yeah. most people need instruction. <laughs> right. Uh, nowadays, you can pretty much do it on your own at home with just YouTube. Oh, yeah. Um, if you're kind of capable and have some Willing to some go ability. through it and figure yeah. it out, yeah. Um, but back then, in the 90s, you, you had to go to somebody's shop. Mm-hmm. So you're an apprentice. Uh, and then once you're a member for three years, you're allowed to test for your journeyman Smith. Okay. So your journeyman test, um, journeyman and master is a two part test. You have to forge out a blade. Uh, there's some parameters on the size. It can't be a sword. It has to be 10 inches or less. Uh, the blade, the whole knife's 15 inches or less overall. Okay. You have to, you have to chop a one inch rope in half in one chop, which just is a sharpness test. Mm Mm-hmm. You then have to chop two two by fours in half, as many chops as you want, but you can't resharpen. And then when you're done, at the end of that, the rope and the two by fours, uh, two two by fours, that knife has to shave hair off your arms. St- Even still. after the two by fours? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, so like, that's a hard I've, test. Like, I've done that with our Super Cub. Really? Yeah. So you do that, and then you put that blade in a vise, and you bend it 90 degrees without breaking it. So what you're showing is you have a knowledge of, of heat treating. Right. You Strength, have a knowledge of steel. Hardness and toughness, wear resistance. Right. Yep. And you're finding that balance, right? A lot of people can make a really hard blade um, that that'll be super, super sharp and work great in the kitchen, but you hit a two by four and a chip blows out of the edge, or right. you bend on it and it snaps. <clears throat> and so again, that's that's that performance side. You then, if you pass that, and you have to do that in a master smith shop. Okay. So, like, I just administered that test to a to a guy that's going for his journeyman this year, Will Stelter. Got it. So you go into their mm. shop, they're critiquing, they have their scorecard or whatever, yep. and they submit that. Yep. Got Measure it. the blade, check it all out, and then they'll call ninety without watch you bend your blade, all that. Right. So <clears throat> do that, and then you have to travel to the, to the Atlanta Blade Show. Uh, it's the biggest knife show in the world, and the American Bladesmith Society is set up there and they have, you know, a ton of master smiths there at that show. And they'll ask those guys to ju- to be on a panel of judges mm-hmm. and you have to present five knives to that panel and they judge fit and finish. Okay. So like last night on your knife, we're making it and I'm telling you like, Hey, the front of this handle is not symmetrical. Right. We got one side thicker than the other. Right. And I told you last night, like that would be a fail. Right. right. So if you have an error like that, like on your handle, if one side's thicker and a different shape than the other side, you either didn't see it, you either uh, didn't care, mm-hmm. or you saw it and you couldn't fix it and didn't know how to fix it. All three of those it are a problem. Matter. That's, that's, that's an a, issue. That's a problem. Yeah. Um, so they judge all your fit and finish, your construction, your knives and whatnot. At the journeyman level, they don't have to be perfect, but they got to be pretty damn good. Hmm. And that basically at that point shows you, you get your journeyman stamp. You're really a professional knife maker. Right. Like you make a damn nice knife better than most people say, oh, my uncle makes knives in his garage. Yeah, but <laughs> this guy's a journeyman. He's actually really, really good. Right. Um, 
once you're a journeyman for at least two years, you can then test for your master smith. Okay. So I did that journeyman at 15 years old. Really? Yep. And that was the youngest it, it's ever done. Yeah. St- still to this yeah. day? Mm-hmm. Wow. So after two years, you can test for your master smith. Well, I was in high school playing sports, working for my dad. I, I was not ready. Mm-hmm. So I didn't even try to test it two years. Uh, I waited. I did my performance part of my test when I was 18. And then I did the master smith. I had a birthday. And by the time Atlanta came around, I did my master smith portion. The difference in that test is your performance blade has to be a Damascus blade. Mm. So you have to forge a Damascus steel out, do the same performance test, and then you take five knives to Atlanta. But the fifth knife in Atlanta has to be a Quillian dagger, which a Quillian dagger is, you know, a dagger, a a double-edged knife, has to be a carved fluted handle with uh, like a sterling silver rope. Okay. Uh, around it. Like there's some some stuff that they tell you. Sure. Has to ha- hit these parameters. Yeah, cuz like I told you when we were forging the Damascus, if I if I take an order and I I put all this work into this knife and it has to be 12 inches long. It just has to be and I screw up and I lose half that steel and I don't have enough steel, I have to start over. Mm-hmm. If I'm just making anything I want, well I'll just adjust and yeah, make, just make something it a little out of smaller. That. You the can Quillian, hide those. The Quillian dagger makes you make something right like you can't just present five of whatever yeah like okay you know you got it right you can present four or whatever but five has to be this exact knife Mm. and so it makes you really dial in and it's a tough knife to make it's very symmetrical it's easy to make mistakes on um but yeah i did that when i was 19 dang yeah and that's still the youngest Mm-hmm. Wow. So yeah. what 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 is usually somebody? How old is somebody usually? Would they be in like their thirties oh, or forties? Yeah, usually around forty. Forty. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, and some of that now is like you have to. You know, it's a time thing, right? You have to be an apprentice for three years. Yeah, of course. So you got to sign somebody up when they're twelve to even have a shot at getting it when you're fifteen. That's true. Yeah. That's you know. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, you know a lot of did you do that on your own? Meaning, what's that? Meaning, was that like your idea? You wanted to do that? No, I really think, honestly, I'll put, I'll give Rick the credit on that. I think when I was at that point, I had to be a, you had to be an apprentice for two years. Okay. Um, back when I did it, mm-hmm. so, um, I really kind of remember that conversation of where Rick was like, I think he was seeing how into it I was, and he was like, hey, uh, I think he told my parents like, you guys should sign him up for the ABS, like he could do this test down the road and be really young when he does it. And I think he saw like I had some drive. Yeah. And so they, you know, I think back then it was like 40 bucks. Now it's like $60 membership a year. Sure. Um, so paid the fee. If, if it would have not panned out, it's not like a bunch yeah, of money, it's not break but you. if you turn around, you just, and I tell people today, like, Hey, if you think you want to do it someday, just join. Right. Cause now you got three years to just be working towards it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the American Bladesmith Society, you know, their their mantra is to preserve and promote the art of the forged blade. Mm. Like, that's all. They want to... And back in the 70s when those guys started that, there was nobody really forging blades. It was kind of a lost art form. Really? Yeah. And so several guys, several gentlemen, half dozen or so, kind of started forging blades again. And it's really why I started my podcast, even though I haven't dropped one for quite a while. <laughs> There was one guy in particular that was really involved back then in like bringing back Damascus steel and forging knives, and he was doing amazing stuff. His name was Don Fogg, and um, I wanted to get Don's voice recorded oh, yeah. because he's old and in poor health, and and like he said, he said something to me that really resonated before I ever interviewed him, and it's it was the whole reason I wanted to start that was he said. It's super rare when you can ever go back to the beginning of something and talk to the person that was there. Oh, for sure. Like the beginning of anything. Right. You you know, and so he was literally, uh, and he's the most humble guy, uh, but you just, you just listen to him talk and it's like, this guy's amazing. Yeah. And he did a lot of, he was a mentor for a lot of us. He came to a lot of uh, conferences and hammer ins and stuff and taught us stuff, you know, when I was in my teens and the guys that taught me were in their thirties and right. Don was like in his fifties, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's really cool to talk to him and like, you're like, man, what was it like? Like, he's like, yeah, there was nobody. He was like, there was me and you know, Jimmy Fikes. And then there was a guy down in Alabama and 
You got, they were all trying to figure yeah, it out. There's no internet. They didn't right. know each other were even really around. So then one time they like met at a gun show. And so <laughs> then they're like, you know, and it's like Bill Moran that started the American Bladesmith Society with B.R. Hughes. B.R. Hughes was a writer and B.R. was like, hey, you know, I write for, you know, like gun di- di- digest, but like I can help you promote this. Like you got, you should, we should start a club. You know, and so they start the American Bladesmith Society. Yeah. Well, let's find more people, more members, because it's like your Iron Council. Like, well, if we have a bunch of people together and we have this one pursuit of like forging knives, well, you know, we can share information with each other. Right. And now we'll we'll go to this knife show, you know, or we'll go to this gun show together and we can learn from each other. Right. And that's where the knife making, like all these knife makers, I don't look at them as competition. They're family and they're people that... I learned from, and I, and I definitely try to help share, I share stuff on my Instagram, like how guys can become better knife makers. Yeah, know? that's cool. That is one thing I've seen in not just your, your line of work, but mo- most communities are like that, whether it's hunting or photography or podcasting. Mm-hmm. When you get a group of people who are, who care about the craft or whatever it is, they want to share and they want to, preserve it like this organization does like so they're right. willing to help other people yeah and even with what i'm doing right now with montana knife company i mean it's different when you're a big brand sure and it's different it's a different feel when it's all you know executives at big companies and whatnot but like i am not here and you never will hear me like telling you why you shouldn't buy another company you right know, like a benchmade i'm not here to tell you why a benchmade sucks or because they don't right i'm i'm here to tell you why you should buy a knife from me and my company yeah and i think benchmade's great and there's a lot of companies that are great and support support those guys that's awesome um now that being said i'm coming for you benchmade <laughs> <laughs> i like it you gotta have that you edge. Know? but it's not it's not because there's funny. they're doing anything wrong it's just they're doing their thing i'm doing and mine you're doing yours yeah and you th- care about it um yeah you don't need to trash people to no you know, get ahead climb over them. I, I want to run around them, not over the top of them. So yeah. what's, what's next for you guys? I mean, we talked a little bit about <clears throat> innovating, adjusting, evolving, growing. What's, what's next for you guys? You know, b- building this building that we're starting right now, setting up, bringing more of our production stuff in house. Mm. You know, if you want to start anything, you can't just go buy all the equipment. So like we outsource some stuff, uh, not to China, <laughs> um, you know, around the U S and, and then as we, have the ability to buy equipment. We have brand new CNC machines on order. Um, We're bringing more and more of what we do in house. Um, It's, it's really, I'm proud to be a part of it because I'm really like doing, building a business. Like my dad built his excavation. business. like he didn't have four backhoes and an excavator and a dump truck. What'd you have? Right. He had one piece of crap backo that he hauled around behind his pickup (laughs) with no dump truck, you know, and built a, built a company. And that's how we're doing it. Um, so honestly, right now, what's next is, frankly, trying to find the right people. Because mm. I am definitely feel like I'm, I'm uh, shoveling in an avalanche right now. <laughs> and I'm losing ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's taken off, which is a great problem. Sure, good problem um, to have. But finding the right people that can help um, is, is really a key. Because, again, I think if you want to grow a great company, a great brand, you have to to let go a little bit and trust people to, to help. And you just can't do it all. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's really the biggest part. And then, yeah, we want to build, we want chef's knives out. We want to get into the self-defense tactical, you know, military type knives down the road. We want to build folding knives. Like those are all things we want to do. They're all goals on the board. Some, uh, sooner than others. Um, again, we're just, one fork, starting, one spoonful at a time. That's right. Starting where you, you can, know. one knife at a time. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, I love what you're doing, man. I'm here to support in any way that I can. I know the guys are too that listen because they love it. I, I talk about it all the time, and and, and, and we see that because your guys, your your Iron Council guys, your podcast people, <laughs> like, yeah, it, it's crazy. I'll be just randomly listening. I well, I posted the other day. I just randomly listen to your podcast, and you start talking about us, and it's like, it's so cool. It's so appreciated. Well, like so I've had people say, oh, like. Like, how are you affiliated with Montana Knife? I'm like, I mean, they're my friends. Like, like, we don't have any business arrangement or anything. And they're like, oh, really? I'm like, no, I just believe in what you guys are doing. I want to support and help how I can. So so many people have done that, including yourself. And honestly, it's one of those, like, as we grow and we get bigger, then 
those are the people we want to support back and 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 get into business business relationships and buy ads from or buy their products sure. or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, no, it's it's amazing and and frankly, we can't buy. Uh, we can't buy internet advertising. It's so like, crazy to me. We, we make weapons. weapons. Yeah. So we can't buy an Instagram a weapon ad. That everybody, every person. I'm, I wasn't. Gonna, I was going to say on the planet, not on the planet, but just about every single person on the planet uses every single day. Right. Some form of a knife. Right. A, yep. Whether it's a butter knife or a steak yep. knife or you're yep. cleaning out a deer, whatever. But we can't boost an Instagram post. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Of even a T-shirt. That's crazy. Oh, really? yeah. Yeah. Isn't that no, wild? a cutting board. Some of that's we tried. Some of the stuff we've tried selling. Some of it was like, well, let's let's do let's do a, a Zippo lighter and see right. if we can boost that. Like, no, you can't. It's your we've actually had flagged. fun. Like, can we can we boost this or that? Like, no, we can't boost anything. Like, you can't. We can't pay for any ads. So, <laughs> we've done this like it's grassroots. Crazy. So people like your listeners, um, you know, people like Joe Rogan, who's just decided to wear our shirt on his yeah, podcast. You know, or use our knife and, you know, Dudley and again, the Sornex crowd, like all these same people. Uh, it's really a cool, huge network. And there's kind of second and third degree. You know, it's not like I'm buddies with Rogan, but I'm friends with his friends. And, sure. Yeah. You know, we all are. It's kind of cool. You know, um, it's pretty amazing what you've created. So keep it up. I'm here to support how I can and really appreciate you sharing some of that story because I know the guys are going to get a lot of value from it. Yeah. And what you say, like, your people, your listeners need to know, like, there's no bullshit when you're talking about what you talk about. A lot of what you talk about is like, yep, that was me. That was yeah. me. That was me. <laughs> I was thinking like this three years ago, right? Or I was that guy in 08 that kind of had had to make a hard choice and, and make a change for the family, but with a bigger picture in mind. Or yeah. that was me two years ago thinking, should I quit my job? And you know, a lot of what you're saying is, is true. And people need to know, like I am, uh, I think a lot of people, they look at a guy like an Evan Hafer or whatever. And they're like, their brand is so big that they're already like, so out of reach that it's like, well, I can never be that. Yeah. And it's like, dude, like we're Montana knife can be still in a small garage. And we're like, think about when the pandemic started. It seems like yesterday in a way and another way it seems like 10 years ago but <laughs> yeah because it lasted way too long True. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I i just can't encourage your people enough to like listen to a lot of what you say and have that courage and passion but also work ethic like none of this shit happens without working yeah you got to work at it and that's the piece i think that separates a lot of people yeah like with your podcast the way you've worked at it and even relinquishing some of the control maybe now with like with you with help with getting different guests and better guests and bigger names and it's like okay well maybe you're not doing it all but you're, that's when it takes off too right you're leaning on somebody that has an expertise that They're you don't have yeah or they just have the time to put more time sure. into that you know yeah um yeah no it's well, I it's think cool um, what you're doing. I think we should go get to work because we got to finish up my knife. You got I, some hand work. To I do. fly out today, so we got to finish this thing up. Yep. All right, brother. I appreciate you. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thanks.